Hello and welcome everyone uh, to this uh, session of Storytime at 9. Uh, this is Sujit from the Bakul Foundation. Uh, we are very happy that so many of you have joined in last time and I can see that I can see the excitement and the interest that many of you have shown to come in today in greater numbers. Uh, this, as you know, is Storytime at 9, which is happening every Saturday at 9 p.m. And we're going live on YouTube and Facebook together. And next time we'll try to be live on Instagram also. And the main idea behind this, you know, this is something, of course, we started at the Bakul Library in Bhubaneswar way back in 2008, uh, in which we call it then the storytelling from around the world, in which every weekend there was a storyteller from a different country coming and telling stories from the country and also about the country. You know, because very little we know actually about the world beyond England or the United States. So this was an attempt at multicultural exposure uh, to know about other cultures. And that is why we have tried to ensure that every month there are storytellers from different continents. So this month, uh, we had someone from Europe already last uh, Saturday. If you've not seen it, the link is there on Facebook. It's there on YouTube. You can still see it. Uh, today, we have Clover from the United States, but then we all think that we know about the United States, but the United States itself is such a diverse country. So today, Clover Bolton, uh, our storyteller for today, is actually going to talk to us about her state, that is Texas, which is almost as big as any country. So she's going to talk specifically about the culture of Texas, uh, of the United States. But then again, next a uh, few Sunday uh, Saturdays, we have someone from Argentina, uh, we have someone from uh, uh, India, and we also have someone uh, from Africa, from Kenya. So different continents altogether, South America, North America, Europe, Asia, um, so all of Africa. So that's something that we've been trying to do. And uh, this is our attempt. And the good thing is because of the digital revolution, we are able to take this beyond viewers only in Bhubaneswar. So last time we had viewers from all across the country. And I see that increasing. And it's good that we are able to reach out to that. Uh, so today, our storyteller is Clover. She had volunteered. You know, Bakul is basically a volunteer-driven organization. All of us volunteer here. And we're trying to demonstrate the power of volunteerism. So this library where I'm sitting right now has been entirely set up through individual book donations. So people have donated books. And that is how the library has grown. And from the beginning, we were very clear that we wanted the library to be rich for multicultural exposure. So there are a lot of picture books and folk tales from different parts of the world that people have contributed. Uh, and Clover Bolton uh, was also volunteering with Bakul. You know, she was here in Orissa. Uh, she was on behalf of the US government, the US Department of State. She was here to support teacher training programs in English in Orissa. And she was introduced to Bakul when she came here. And she liked the volunteers here, liked the spirit of volunteerism in the people who volunteered here. And she joined into volunteers. She used to tell stories at a library, help us with other things also. You know, so I remember I used to joke that uh, she used to come and also volunteer in helping to sort clothes that people had donated, which would then go to people who need. And she would be, I called her the most expensive volunteering uh, thing because she would take an Uber, travel about eight to 10 kilometers, come and sort the clothes and then go back. But then that's Clover. Uh, I think over to her now, she's going to introduce her country, the United States, but primarily her state, Texas, and tell you stories. And at the end, we're going to have a question and answer session as we had last time. So any of you want to have questions, you know, if you have questions that come up to your mind, what you could do is you can just post them in the comments box. You know, wherever you're seeing this on Facebook or YouTube, you can post your comment, your question there, and please put your name there. You know, not the name of your parent, which comes in the profile or the um, ID that you're using, but, you know, the children who are listening, please use your own name. And we will be sharing a... A feedback form 
you know, it is very valuable for us to get your feedback. So please do give your feedback as well. But that's the feedback is at the end of the program. But before that, you have Clover and she will be sharing with you about telling you about Texas, United States and stories from Texas. So over to you, Clover. Hi, Sujit. It's so good to see you again. It's been a long time. Um, and thank you so much for the invitation to be able to do the storytelling event um, with um, Bakul. And I'm excited to get to share um, one of my favorite stories, which is called The Jalapeno Man. Um, and it's the gingerbread man story, if you're familiar with that one but told from a Texas perspective. And so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here in just a moment so that I can um, give you a little bit of background on Texas and as well as uh, some information that might be helpful when it comes to understanding parts of the story that we're going to read together. So let's see. All right, so it should be sharing here soon. There we go. And so when we think about where, um, so I live in the United States and if we're looking at a world map, we can see that it's quite a distance from India. Um, but one of the neat things about Texas is there's actually a lot of similarities between India and Texas. Within the United States, we have 50 different states. And um, Texas is the one that I currently live in. And like in India, how all the different states within India have their own foods and their own cultures and um, things that make them unique from one another, the United States is very much the same way. And Texas is very proud of Texas. And if Texas were to draw a map, of what the United States would look like, it would probably be something like that. Um, Texas, um, Texas thinks that um, they are the best, which they are. And uh, there is a phrase that everything is bigger in Texas. And so when we think about something that's Texas size, we're thinking about something that's really large. And so this is a Texans map of the United States where Texas is centered and the most important thing. Um, the capital of Texas is Austin and that is where I live is I live in Austin and so we have several large cities and this picture here happens to be Austin um, where I live but I think that Texas is known more for its big open landscapes. And this is a picture from King Branch. And there's lots of open space in Texas. Um, and so that that's more the setting of what our story is going to be like. It will look more like this picture of King Ranch than it does of Austin. A little bit about me. Uh, this is my house. Um, I bought my first house uh, in March which at the start of a pandemic is a very exciting time to try and buy a house. And so um, I've been happy that with all of this time spent at home, I've been able to work on my new home. And I live with my cat and his name is Bongo. And hopefully he stays asleep through our storytelling. Sometimes he likes to come and be heard. Um, and so hopefully he, he stays asleep this time. So flags, we have a flag for the state, of, uh, for the United States, and it's, we call it the Stars and Stripes, and it has 13 stripes on it, uh, one for each of the original 13 colonies of the United States when it was still uh, part of the British Empire. And then we have 50 stars in the blue section, and the stars represent each state um, within the country. And so if we were to add another state to our country, then we would also add another star. And then to the right, we have the Texas flag. 
It has the exact same colors as the United States flag. They actually don't know who designed the Texas flag. Um, so that's an interesting little fact about the flag is they don't know who designed it. And it has one star on it and that star is for Texas. And Texas calls itself the Lone Star State. Um, food. Food is one of the favorite things um, about Texas. And there are lots and lots of different types of food that Texas is known for. But the two most popular types of food would be Tex-Mex, which is over here on the left. And Tex-Mex um, has a lot of similar spices to Indian food. There's um, lots of cumin in there and lots of peppers and it can be spicy and things like that. Um, I think that the spiciness of Texas food has helped me in my travels in other countries because um, I haven't had food that's been too spicy for me yet. And then barbecue is another very popular um, dish in Texas. And it's hard to go far in Texas without seeing some place where you can get barbecue. Um, for me, it's a lot of meat. And so um, I don't have it often um, just because it's a lot of meat. Let's see. Next slide. There we go. Um, so then music is also a big part of Texas. Austin, where I live, is known as the live music capital of the world. And what that means is that normally we have music that's being played all throughout the city at all times. And we have large major music festivals. There's an international one called South by Southwest and it draws visitors from all around the world and it's held in March. And then we have Austin City Limits, which is a three day music festival. And um, it's usually in October. Um, both of those have been canceled for this year, but we'll get back to our music scene um, soon enough. But Willie Nelson is probably one of the most famous Texas musicians that we have. And he, he got famous in the 1960s. Like he, he'd been playing music well before that, but he got famous in the 1960s and he's still performing today. And I think he's 88 years old now. He's almost 90 and he is still up on the stage and performing. And uh, he's one of the beloved legends of Texas. And okay, so um, I'm not sure if they have music ready, but we were gonna try and play a little bit of Willie Nelson so you guys could hear it. Um, but I'm not sure if there is something there. Let me ask, any music available, you guys? No, okay. So we're gonna go on to the next slide. Um, there are lots of things to do and see if you were to come and visit Texas. And um, I just put three things that might be of interest, but there are so many other things that you can always do here. But um, one of the most beautiful buildings, in my opinion, that I have visited in the United States is the Texas State Capitol. And the Texas State Capitol is located in Austin. Again, that's the city that I live in. And it is the governing body of the entire state. Um, what's interesting about this, because as I said earlier, everything is bigger in Texas. The Texas Capitol building is larger than the United States Capitol building. And we like to let everybody know that. Um, then in the top right, that is the NASA Space Center. And that is located in Houston, which is the largest city in Texas. And this is where when um, the Apollo space mission was um, having its challenges, they were communicating with um, the workers at the NASA Space Center in Houston. So if that famous line, Houston, we have a problem, it's because they were talking with um, the people in the NASA Space Center in Houston, Texas. And then on the bottom right, that is a picture of the Alamo. 
And the Alamo is located in San Antonio, Texas. And it's actually really small when you look at it, but it is famous. Uh, it's a famous site of a battle that Texas did not win. And it was when Texas was fighting for their independence. And so a very common phrase that you will hear is remember the Alamo because shortly after the Alamo battle, there was another battle and they did win that one, but it was one with the idea that we cannot repeat what happened at the Alamo. And so remember the Alamo, keep going forward. And then just a couple of fun facts about Texas. Texas has been ruled by six different countries during its time. So um, if you look at the bottom left picture over here, there are six different flags. Texas has been ruled by the country of Spain, by the country of France, by the country of Mexico. Texas also used to be its own independent country. And then uh, this one is when Texas was part of the Confederacy States of America. And that was during the Civil War times when um, we were having the war between the Northern States and the Southern States, and it was a part of the Southern States. And then of course, Texas is currently a part of the United States of America. Um, I know I've mentioned this, but Texas is big. It is the second largest state in the entire United States. Alaska is the only one that's bigger than us. The other interesting thing about the size of Texas is that it is larger than any country in the entire continent of Europe. And then one last interesting fact about Austin is that it has the largest urban bat population. And so this is a bunch of bats and they live under a bridge in downtown Austin. And when the sun goes down, you can watch the bats fly out from underneath the bridge and they will go and get their food for the night and then come back uh, when the sun starts to come up in the morning. So my connections with Bakul. I was uh, a volunteer at Bakul uh, in 2016 and 17. Um, I was there as an English language fellow uh, through the Department of State um, to work with teacher training as Sujit had mentioned earlier. And I will say that of my first year in India, which was in Bhupaneshwar, my favorite part was being at Bakul. I loved working with the volunteers. I loved working with the kids and it was the highlight of my entire year. And so I can't thank Sujit and all of the volunteers there and all of the kids enough for the joy that they brought to me um, with my work there. And so this is a picture of when we were on the left, that was with Julie Kalso. She was another English language fellow. She was in Chennai and we were doing a storytelling on the US or not U.S. elections, um, but like on President's Day. And then to the right, it, this wasn't a storytelling event, but this was um, like a book writing. And so I worked with another volunteer, Sarah from Italy, and she um, and I worked with um, Suchi and some other volunteers, and we um, helped with the making of books and things like that with students or with children. So real quickly, before we get into the reading, I wanted to go over a couple of things that will come up in the book. The book takes place in Texas and it has very Texas things about it. And so you may be familiar or you may not be familiar with some of the things that I'm going to show you. The first one is the Rio Grande River. And the Rio Grande River is a very large river that serves as the border between the United States and part of Mexico. And so to the left is a picture of just, it's just a beautiful, like parts of it are just so beautiful. And then on the right is a map that shows the border that it makes between the United States and Mexico. Then we have Vaquero or cowboy. Vaquero is cowboy in Spanish. And so uh, you will hear that in this book as well. 
and cowboys uh, tend to ride horses and they move cattle from one area to another area. And then jalapeno or chili piquin peppers, very hot, very spicy, used in lots of our cooking. And so just wanted to show you what some of those peppers looked like. Wildflowers, they are mentioned in the story and uh, Texas has some of the most beautiful wildflowers around. And if you can come and visit Texas, I would say come in the springtime because that picture at the bottom with the field, they're all covered in flowers in the springtime. It's very beautiful. Mesa, it's a rock structure. It's kind of like a mountain, but there's no top on it and it's low, like it's not a very high one. And so it's got a flat top to it. And then there's lots of animals that are in uh, this story. So we have a longhorn steer and uh, the university here in Austin, their school mascot is the longhorn. There is the armadillo that will also be in here and they have a hard outer shell. They're not the prettiest animal, but they are certainly an interesting animal. Javelinas. Javelinas kind of look like pigs. They're real furry and they can get really aggressive. And so one of the things you'll notice is like I'm saying javelina as opposed to javelina. And, and that's a lot of the Spanish influence. So J is with a sound instead of a J sound. Then we have a Palomino stallion. Beautiful, beautiful horses. Rattlesnakes. And so if you're not familiar with a rattlesnake, you definitely want to stay far away from those. And the end of their tail has, is a rattle. And it, it, when they shake it, it's their warning sign that they might attack soon. Coyotes, which are like wild dogs. And then so here we are at our story, the jalapeno man. And so I'm hoping that those vocabulary words will help you better picture what's happening in the story. So this story, the author is Debbie Leland and it's illustrated by Ann Hollis Reif. So way down south in a small Texas town called Salsa, where the sun sets, but the heat never rests, where fire ants build mounds as big as houses and the Rio Grande River runs hotter than lava, lived a little rancher and his wife. And being as everything was so hot and salsa, when the little old rancher's wife went to bake a special gingerbread surprise for her husband, she gathered the spiciest jalapeno and chili pecan peppers she could find. The little old rancher's wife wanted to make a real gingerbread vaquero. So she decorated him with a 10 gallon jalapeno hat and a pointy and a pair of pointy toed jalapeno boots, a black licorice lasso and a set of silver ball spurs. She used a chili pepper for his mouth and a pecan for his buckle on his belt. Just as she put the last swirl on his blue bandana, that cowboy jumped off the plate and shouted, yippee yay yay and ran across the floor, out the swinging doors, across the front porch, and down the gravel driveway like a bandit running from the law. Oh my, shouted the little rancher's wife running after him, come back. Come back, shouted the little old rancher who was mending a barbed wire fence. Yee-haw, shouted the gingerbread cowboy. Run, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the red hot jalapeno man. He ran into a field where blue bonnets rolled like ocean waves, where Mexican hats two-stepped with black-eyed Susans and Indian paintbrushes grew as wild as mustangs. He passed a steer grazing in the grass. Stop, stop, 
shouted the longhorn steer. You smell sweeter than some rain. Yee-haw, he shouted. I ran away from a little old rancher and his wife, and I can run away from you too. I can, I can. I'm the red hot jalapeno man. He ran past prickly pear cacti with thorns as sharp as porcupine quills and with flowers so rich in color, they looked as if the sun had stopped by and dripped into each one. He nearly tripped over an armadillo asleep in the brush. Stop, stop, shouted the armadillo. I'm as hungry as a cowboy coming off the range. Yee-haw, he shouted. I ran away from a little old rancher, his wife, and a longhorn steer. And I can run away from you too, I can, I can. I'm the red, hot, jalapeno man. He ran into the pasture where the oil wells pumped up and down with the rhythm of a fiddling playing band and where pecan trees polkaed while yuccas cotton-eyed Joe in the silhouette of the setting sun. He ran past a band of javelinas. Stop, stop, shouted the javelinas. You'll taste much better than these mesquite beans. Yee-haw, he shouted. I ran away from a little old rancher, his wife, a longhorn steer, and an armadillo. And I can run away from you too, I can, I can. I'm the red, hot, jalapeno man. And he kept running. He ran past wooden windmills spinning faster than wagon wheels, faster than West Texas tumbleweeds, faster than thunderstorms rolling across the plains. He ran past the Palomino racing up the hill. Stop, stop, shouted the Palomino stallion, raising his front legs high in the air. Yee-haw, he shouted. I ran away from a little old rancher, his wife, a longhorn steer, an armadillo, and a band of javelinas. And I can run away from you too. I can, I can. I'm the red hot jalapeno man. He ran past fields where cotton looked like snow, where road runners pretended to be sheriffs and tarantulas were the deputies. He passed a rattlesnake sunning on a rock. Stop shouted the diamondback rattlesnake, shaking his tail like maracas in a mariachi band. I could swallow you whole. Yee-haw, he shouted. I ran away from a little old rancher, his wife, a longhorn steer, an armadillo, a band of javelinas, and a palomino stallion. And I can run away from you too. I can, I can. I'm the red, hot, jalapeno man. By this time, the jalapeno man was positive that no one could catch him. Not the black-tailed jackrabbit, not the white-tailed deer, not even the red-tailed hawk. The jalapeno man noticed the coyote following him. He turned and shouted, you can't catch me, no one can. Oh my, said the clever coyote. Even if I could, I wouldn't try to catch you. The jalapeno man ran until he came to the bank of the Rio Grande River. He didn't dare jump into the water. Oh no, because if he did, he would crumble faster than a mockingbird changes songs when she sings. But if he didn't cross the river, the posse would catch him and sure as a horned toad catches flies for breakfast. Jump on my tail and I'll swim across with you, the coyote offered with an innocent grin. The jalapeno man jumped on the coyote's tail. 
the coyote slid into the river. As they reached the middle of the river, the coyote said, it's getting deeper. Maybe you should climb onto my back. The jalapeno man jumped onto the coyote's back. When they were nearly to the other side of the river, the coyote said, you might get wet. Maybe you should jump onto my nose. The jalapeno man jumped onto the coyote's nose. As soon as the coyote stepped out of the river, he threw his head back and flipped the jalapeno man like a bucking bronco, tossing a buckaroo off his back. Snip, snap, snip. The coyote licked his lips. The posse arrived at the edge of the Rio Grande just in time to see the coyote running up the bank, breathing fire with every breath. That jalapeno man was hotter than a hundred scorpion stings, hotter than the Texas sun at high noon, hotter than a branding iron right out of the coals. The coyote ran to the top of the mesa and howled. He howled all through the night until he nearly melted the moon. He had some bad jalapeno breath. I'll walk a mile across burning coals, said the coyote. I'll sit on a thousand cacti, but as long as I live, I'll never eat another jalapeno man again. All right, so that was the jalapeno man, and I hope that you enjoyed it. It had some Texas language in there, as well as some uh, lots of information that's distinct to Texas. And so, Sujit, I'm not sure that we have time to do another one. Oh, we do? We can do another story. Do another story? Okay. Yeah. All right. All right, so I'm gonna give a little bit more vocabulary again about um, that will help with the next story, which is going to be the legend of the blue bonnet, um, which is one of the flowers that I had shown you earlier, but I'll show you again. So this is a, uh, a legend from the Comanche tribe and the Comanches are a Native American uh, group that were here in the Americas before the Europeans came and colonized. And uh, they were very prolific in the Southern United States. And um, when the Europeans started to colonize uh, the region that we know as Texas today, they also brought a lot of diseases with them. And so those diseases killed a lot of the Native American population and then wars and um, that happened with taking over the land and things like that also occurred. Um, we still have some Comanches, but um, they are not as prolific in this area as they once were. And then this is just a picture of blue bonnets. This is the Texas state flower and um, and so this is the legend about how this flower came to be and uh, why we see it every spring um, all throughout the state of Texas. Drought um, is, in case you're not familiar, drought is just when there has not been rain for a very long period of time and um, it can create a difficult um, environment to grow food. And when we cannot grow food, then we have famine. And when, and so that is when there is a shortage of food and it can impact communities and um, they don't have enough to eat and to survive. This is a Comanche shaman or a medicine man. And they would give advice as to uh, like, to try and help the tribe overcome something like a drought. Like what are things we can do so that there isn't so much drought? And then this is 
a teepee and not all Native Americans lived in teepees. And so I think that is a myth that has been portrayed about um, Native Americans in the United States. Uh, but the Comanches, they did live in teepees. All right, so we're going to read the legend of the blue bonnet. And this is an old tale. So this is a retelling of the story and it's illustrated and retold by Tommy DePaolo. And Tommy DePaolo is one of my favorite authors. And um, there are lots of other books as well that you might want to check out. Great spirits, the land is dying. Your people are dying too. The long line of dancers sang, tell us what we have done to anger you. End the drought, save your people. Tell us what we must do so you will send the rain that will bring back life. For three days, the dancers danced to the sound of the drums. And for three days, the people called Comanche watched and waited. And even though the hard winter was over, no healing rains came. Drought and famine are hardest on the very young and the very old. Among the few children left was a small girl named She Who Is Alone. She sat by herself watching the dancers. In her lap was a doll made from buckskin, a warrior doll. The eyes, nose, and mouth were painted on with the juice of berries. It wore beaded leggings and a belt of polished bone. On its head were brilliant blue feathers from the bird who cries, J, J, J. She loved her doll very much. Soon, she who is alone said to her doll, the shaman will go off alone to the top of the hill to listen for the words of the great spirits. Then we will know what to do so that once more the rains will come and the earth will be green and alive. The buffalo will be plentiful and the people will be rich again. As she talked, she thought of the mother who made the doll, of the father who brought the blue feathers. She thought of the grandfather and the grandmother she had never known. They were all like shadows. It seemed long ago that they had died from the famine. The people had named her and cared for her. The warrior doll was the only thing she had left from those distant days. The sun is setting, the runner called as he ran through the camp. The shaman is returning. The people gathered in a circle and the shaman spoke. I have heard the words of the great spirits, he said. The people have become selfish. For years they have taken from the earth without giving anything back. The great spirits say the people must sacrifice. We must make a burnt offering of the most valued possessions among us. The ashes of this offering shall then be scattered to the four points of the earth, the home of the winds. When this sacrifice is made, drought and famine will cease. Life will be restored to the earth and to the people. The people sang a song of thanks to the great spirits for telling them what they must do. I'm sure it is not my new bow that the great spirits want, a warrior said. Or my special blanket, a woman added. As everyone went to their teepees to talk and think over what the great spirits had asked. Everyone that is, except she who is alone. She held her doll tightly to her heart. You, she said, looking at the doll, you are my most valued possession. It is you the great spirits want. And she knew what she must do. 
As the council fires died out and the teepee flaps began to close, the small girl returned to the teepee where she slept to wait. The night outside was still except for the distant sound of the night bird with the red wings. Soon everyone in the teepee was asleep except she who is alone. Under the ashes of the teepee fire, one stick still glowed. She took it and quietly crept out into the night. She ran to the place on the hill where the great spirits had spoken to the shaman. Stars filled the sky, but there was no moon. Oh, great spirits, she who is alone said, here is my warrior doll. It is the only thing I have for my family who died in this famine. It is my most valued possession. Please accept it. Then gathering twigs, she started a fire with the glowing fire stick. The small girl watched as the twigs began to catch and burn. She thought of her grandmother and grandfather, her mother and father, and all the people, their suffering, their hunger. And before she could change her mind, she thrust the doll into the fire. She watched until the flames died down and the ashes had grown cold. Then scooping up a handful, she who is alone scattered the ashes to the home of the winds, the north and the east, the south and the west. And there she fell asleep until the first light of the morning sun woke her. She looked out over the hill and stretching out from all sides where the ashes had fallen, the ground was covered with flowers, beautiful flowers, as blue as the feathers in the hair of the doll, as blue as the feathers of the bird who cries, J, J, J. When the people came out of their teepees, they could scarcely believe their eyes. They gathered on the hill with she who is alone to look at the miraculous sight. There was no doubt about it. The flowers were a sign of forgiveness from the great spirits. And as the people sang and danced their thanks to the great spirits, a warm rain began to fall and the land began to live again. From that day on, the little girl was known by another name, one who dearly loved her people. And every spring, the great spirits remember the sacrifice of a little girl and fill the hills and valleys of the land, now called Texas, with the beautiful blue flowers, even to this very day. Thank you, Clover. That was wonderful. Uh, you know, uh, the, the illustrations by Tommy D. Paul are very striking. Yeah. Really. In fact, that uh, reminded me, we have this beautiful book in the library. Sorry. <laughs> now one foot, now the other by Tommy D. Paola. And I love the illustrations there as well. So, you know, after, for the children here, those of you who are in Bhubaneswar or in Odisha, after things get better from COVID, you know, you can come down to the library and check out these books. And in fact, you know, when you were telling me about, you know, telling us rather the story of the Jalapeno Man, a kind of a Texan retelling of uh, the gingerbread man, uh, I was kind of thinking, you know, in India, of course, in our tradition of storytelling with the Ramayana and the epics, you know, the Mahabharata, mm -hmm. there are many different versions of the Ramayana and Mahabharata, you know, so retellings, uh, which is more localized, is a very common thing but you know after the and i used to think that in the west that doesn't happen the stories are fixed but like you told today and i remember this beautiful book which had been a discovery for me the stinky cheese man which yeah. is also a retelling of the gingerbread man uh, by john Sieska, and also i remember this book the true story of the three little so that was really nice in fact uh, 
uh, I, you were mentioning this uh, the Texan Cinderella also. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, there's a book in our library called the Persian Cinderella, and there's also a Chinese Red Riding Hood. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Either way. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, so I think we have a lot of questions, Clover, uh, that have been coming in. Okay. The first question is, of course, uh, from Sudiksha. You no, know, it's interesting. You mentioned that Texas. She asked that uh, you mentioned about bats in Texas, that it is a huge bat population. Yes. So when the coronavirus hit Texas, was everyone worried about the bats? And tell us about the COVID experience in Texas. We hear that it's very bad in the US. How is it in Texas and about bats? Okay. So the bats, we were never worried as far as their relation with COVID. Um, it's Austin has a one. Of, Austin has a lot of nicknames. Uh, one of its nicknames is the Bat City, and it's because we have hundreds of thousands of bats that live. Um, but for the most part, there's no interaction between the humans and the bats. Just that the humans like to go and watch the bats fly out when the sun comes down, and um, and it's really beautiful because you have the sun setting over the river, you have the bats flying out, and so it's it's more of just a a beauty thing than anything. Uh -huh. um, COVID, um, as you guys, I'm sure, have seen on the news, it is quite bad in the United States right now. We have a lot of cases, and um, and Texas is one of the challenging areas. So there are, at the moment, right now, um, the three biggest hot spots would be Florida, California, and Texas, and so it's impacting. Um, things like my job. So I work in elementary school. So we are supposed to have, our, we are having our first day of school on August 20th, but we will be starting 100% online. So there will be no students going into the schools. Um, the earliest we will have students coming into school will be September 10th, um, but even that could change. And so in my job right now, I'm helping uh, create lessons that teachers can use with their students in an online platform. And I will be training our teachers on how to use our new learning system that is, a, is completely online. Oh. Uh, does Texas claim Batman? Does it say no. Batman? Texas, Texas claims a lot of things, but Batman is not one of them. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Padmini Patra is asking, does Mexico also have a large number of bats? I do believe that there are um, some large bat populations in Mexico as well. Just we are so close to Mexico, but I don't have a lot of knowledge about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Heman Seth, who is a principal of a school in Sunabeda, uh, asks if there are historical monuments in Texas. There are. So the picture um, that I showed of the Alamo is probably our most famous historical monument that we have. Um, and then we have uh, like it's a big pillar outside of Houston for the Battle of San Jacinto, uh, which was the battle that happened after the Alamo. Um, there is a building that was wasn't really that imp like that important of a building, I would say. Um, but it's uh, the building uh, where the assassin for, of JFK was at. And so that is another place where you can go and visit is like uh, where that happened. Um, and I'm sure there's other things. I just can't think of them right now. There's a, if you think of Stonehenge in England, there is a Cadillac thing, like where they've taken Cadillac cars and they've arranged them. Similarly, I've not seen that myself, but um, there's that too. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Tanishka is asking, how are you managing with this pandemic? Managing with the what? Pandemic. COVID. The pandemic. Um, I spend a lot of time by myself with my cat. Um, <laughs> and, and I am lucky that my job allows me to work from home. And... Um, I can get most things delivered to my house. So um, I don't have to go out often. And so um, I feel very fortunate in my position, in my role and uh, where I live that um, it hasn't affected me too much directly. Uh -huh. So Gargi is asking you, 
uh, what is your favorite book from India? And Niharika is asking if you know of any moral stories from India. I would say that my knowledge of books from India is very limited. And I'm not sure that I can think of any. I know that I've read some when I was there, but I don't recall. Like that's been, it's been a while. It's been four years, Suji. It's been a while. <laughs> wow. Seems like yesterday. I know. I, I was surprised when I realized that it was four years ago that I was yeah. moving to Bhuvaneshwar. So. Yeah. So Smruti is asking, what is the main source of income for people in Texas? What is the main social? Source of income. Income. Oh, source of income. Um, let's see. We have a large oil industry in Texas. And so there are lots of people who work in the oil industry. Um, then we have several large universities that also employ a lot of people uh, in Texas. Like in Austin, we have a lot of tech companies. Um, so Dell Computers is based out of the Austin area. But then we also have places like um, Apple Computers. They're, they have one campus here in Austin, but they're opening up a second one. Um, HP, IBM, like they, they all have locations here. Uh, Tesla is coming to Austin. They just purchased land and they are building um, a site for themselves. They just spent, I think, what, $95 million on the land that they're going to be building on. Um, so that's a huge industry that's coming in for us is to have Tesla coming to Austin. So. But as you mentioned, oil is there because I remember hearing about the Texas oil lobby, which is supposed to be very powerful. Yes. Yeah. So. And and that's not that's not in the Austin area. So like I, I know Austin the best. I mean, Texas is a big state. Um, Austin is very much technology driven or politically driven because it's the governing seat for the state. But oil is there. We do have a, a, a film industry that is growing in Texas or it was before pandemic. Um, don't ask me any questions about film. I'm not a movie person at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sarbani, uh, Sarbani is asking, what is jalapeno? Uh, jalapeno is a pepper. Um, it's a spicy, um, a spicy like pepper. A chili, like a chili? Oh, chili yeah. yeah, it's a, like a chili pepper. Um, and it's, uh, they can be spicy and it's used in a lot of our cooking. So Arush is asking, what do cowboys do? They move cows. <laughs> so, so they uh, go along on horseback and uh, they kind yeah. of herd the cows? And I think, I mean, I'm sure that cowboys, like, I know they still exist. Um, I've not met a real one. Like, I've met people who wear cowboy hats and boots, um, and I have boots. But um, as far as meeting a real cowboy, I've never met one. Um, but, they, but they are going to be more in those open areas than in the cities, which... I live in a city and um, their main job is to take care of like the cattle and to get them to where they need to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, Arohi is asking, what is your favorite American food and your favorite Indian food? My favorite Indian food is Malabar Parathas. Like they're <laughs> this? The, Mal the Malabar Parathas, like uh, uh, those were, Parathas, yeah. So good. But um, you didn't have that in Bhubaneswar, I'm sure. You what? probably had it in Delhi. Did you have Malabar Parathas in Bhubaneswar? No, I had them in Delhi. Um, there was a restaurant in Delhi that I would go there specifically for the Parathas. So um, yeah. they were so good. That That's probably the thing I miss the most. Um, and I've. American food. Oh, um, I'm like Thai food. Um, <laughs> So there, I don't know if there really is like a typical American food, um, just because we're influenced by so many different things. Um, this is, I think this is always the hardest question I have, like what is my favorite American food? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know how to answer that one um, because like when I think about my favorite foods, it's not the things that are typically American, like what people would think of as typically American. Like I really love Thai food. 
Um, but that's from Thailand. <laughs> so, so Anshi is also asking, uh, is there a staple food of Texas? Um, queso? Oh, no, tacos. Tacos. That would be my favorite food, tacos. Um, especially in Austin, tacos are a staple. And there's breakfast tacos. And then there's tacos that you can have for lunch or dinner as well. Uh, so breakfast tacos um, are very popular in Austin. Um, and that would probably, that was the thinking back to what did I miss uh, when I was living in India that I could not get and it was a good taco. Um, so that would probably be a staple and one of my favorites. And is, uh, I read somewhere about chilies. Uh, are chilies also kind of staple food in Texas? So the chili peppers are used in a lot of our cooking. Um, chili, which is like our- other one that you showed me, yeah. Is our state dish. And chili is a combination of different spices mixed with meat um, and that have, has been slow cooked. Um, and some, some people will put beans into the chili as well. Um, it's very controversial. You either like it or you don't and people get and very heated conversations about whether they have beans in their chili. Um, but it served with like cheese or sour cream on top, onions, things like that. It's like a- so the, restaurant chain, the restaurant chain Chili's, which serves Tex-Mex food, that takes its name from this chili, uh, the preparation? With no. Meat? So that chili is like the chili pepper. <laughs> Okay. Um, I don't think you can actually get the dish chili at Chili's. Mm -hmm. So there are some questions about Texan language. So Rabishta is asking, what is the meaning of howdy? Hello. <laughs> uh, Niyati is asking, who's your favorite author? Um... I'm trying to think of something that's not just like kid books because I feel like all I do is read kid books lately. Um, I don't know. That's a really good question. I, I tend not to just read one author, so I don't know if I really have a favorite author. I have a favorite genre that I like to read, which is historical fiction, uh, particularly like World War II era fiction. And so um, I, I read a lot of different authors, but take place during World War II. Um, you know, Sukanya was asking you if there's a book that you would recommend to a teenager. So is there any historical fiction that you would recommend to her on World War II? Um, yes, but I can't think of the name of it right now. But it was one that I, when I taught middle school, that I had recommended to some students. And I can't think of it. But if I think of it, Sujit, I will. Yeah, I will please share it and we'll share it in the comments box. Uh, Trupti Tapasi is asking, you know, her daughter wants to know more about books, uh, st stories of Texas and cowboys. So could you suggest a few titles? Yes, let me grab, uh, I have two other books with me. Um, so, and they're, they're fun ones, uh, like the Jalapeno Man. So this is Bubba, the Cowboy Prince. This way. And yeah. Bubba the Cowboy Prince is a Texas version of Cinderella. And so this is Bubba, and Bubba is Cinderella. So it's with the with a boy as um, the main character instead of a girl. And then um, this one is Armadillo Chili. And this is an armadillo who's making chili, the dish chili. And so um, and then at the end, so you can see she's got her bowl of chili in front of her. It's like a stew. But um, so again, it, this has a lot of animals that are Texas specific, as well as language and things like the dish chili and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, Himnish is asking if you've ever met a cowboy. No, <laughs> I haven't. Uh, Neha is asking the age of your cat. He is 17 years old. He's old. That's like 84 years old in human years. Hmm. 
Uh, Aditi is asking, by any chance, if you have read Ruskin Bond? Looks like I think she likes Ruskin Bond. Okay. Um, and similarly, Abhinash is asking if you've heard of the Akbar Birbal stories. Yeah. Yeah. They are, you know, popular folk tales in India. Akbar yeah. was a Mughal king. Yeah. Okay. Now we have questions. Um, sorry. Uh, sorry. Shagufa is asking, what are the things that you liked in India when you visited India? I loved Kerala. Like, as far as like a location, it was so beautiful and um, being able to go on one of those boats through the backwaters um, and it had really good, fresh seafood. I think I really liked Southern India a lot because Pondicherry and uh, Chennai were two of my other favorite locations that I visited. Just, I liked the spiciness of the food. Um, I liked the, the beaches and things like that. Um, and then um, my second year in India, I lived in Delhi and I like what I liked about living in Delhi was just the ease of getting around like with the metro and um, just like there was so much to do and I, it was easy to be a lot more independent there. So Ori is asking if you read the gingerbread man first or the jalapeno man first and which one did you do you like more? I read the gingerbread man first. Um, just because the jalapeno man, I don't think was written until about 2010. So it's a, it's a relatively new version of the story, but I do like the jalapeno man a lot more. He, he's got a lot more spice and spunk to him than the regular gingerbread man. Uh, so Sadnik is asking about the chupacabra, you know, do you know the legendary monster? So do people- I've heard of it. <laughs> believe in them? I'm sorry? Do people in Texas believe in them? Do you think, uh, have you ever thought that you've seen one? No, no. Um, and I don't, I, I like, I only heard of Chupacabra like not that long ago. So, um, yeah, so no. <laughs> so Tina from Delhi is asking, What's your favorite flower? You showed a lot of flowers. Which is your favorite flower? Oh, um, right now, I really, well, I love sunflowers. I think that those are always just like a happy, happy flower. And so, um, and they look nice, like on the table or anything like that. Like, and it, they're very easy to take care of. But in my garden that I'm growing right now, I have a butterfly garden. And so I have lots of milkweed plants. And so they're blooming in like this brilliant orange color. And so I'm liking the milkweeds right now. So Je I think we'll end with this. Jay Prakash is asking, what is you know unique about Texas? And uh, uh, Shagufa is also asking, you know, how is Texas different from other states of the United States? Um, there's a lot of things that are unique to Texas. Um, just, I think that it's size alone, um, kind of means that it has a culture that's very different than the rest. Um, it's proximity to Mexico also means that we have a lot of biculturalism here. So we have, um, a lot of people from Mexico, um, that live here in Texas, which is great because it, it makes our culture richer and, my Spanish is not very good, but you hear a lot of Spanish being spoken around um, and things like that. Like I can, I can get by okay. Um, if I'm immersed in Spanish, I do a lot better. Um, but I think that that's one of the nice, unique things about Texas is its proximity to Mexico and the influences that we have from Mexico um, that you wouldn't see in states like New York. Um, I think that there's a lot of phrases that are very unique to Texas, like the howdy and the y'all and things like that. Um, and then if you like sports, Texas has a lot of professional sports and college level sports. Um, and Texans really love their sports. 
I'm not originally from Texas. So the sport thing, like watching football, like, like American football does not interest me, but it is a, it's almost, a, they call it a religion here. It's not really a religion, but they call it a religion. Wow. That's something similar. In India, cricket is the religion, as you know. Yes. <laughs> so thank you very much, Clover. I think we all had a great time. There are more questions, but we have run out of time now. So we won't be able to take that. But just to tell everyone, uh, we'll be back again next Saturday at 9 p.m. with another storytelling. Now, the country that will be represented next Saturday is the country that gets its name from the fact that it is it lies east of a particular river, which gives it the name as well. So which country are we talking about and what is the river? Remember, as I said, you know, the Greeks use this name to define the country that lies east of this particular river. So that is the country that will be there for the stories next Saturday. Now, today, there's a little task for you after this. As I said, you know, we have, uh, we will be sharing or we've already shared a feedback form uh, in the comments box in uh, both YouTube and Facebook. Uh, so we would like you to give your feedback. And along with that, you know, as we did last time, we request you to share a photo of yours with your favorite book. Now, if it happens to be a book that Clover talked about today, then you may stand to get a prize from Bakul. So please share your photos uh, with your favorite books. We would love to because we heard what Clover likes, but we don't know what you like. So I'm sure Clover and all of us at Bakul would love to see what books you read. And there's a feedback form there again. And uh, as I said, uh, look forward to seeing you again next Saturday. Meanwhile, uh, as we sign off, our volunteers will play a short film. If you have time, it's a two minute film. You can just see the film to get a little idea about what Bakul does. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.